Hi again, everybody, and welcome to Inside Golf. I'm Harry Donahue. Today from Philadelphia Country Club, Gladwin, Pennsylvania, because Philadelphia Country Club was where 100 years ago the East Falls Golf Association got started. We're going to find out what's happened over the course of 100 years and how the East Falls Golf Association is alive and well celebrating its centennial. The East Falls Golf Association, next on Inside Golf. Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf. 54 courses, 300,000 yards. Check them out at montcogolf.com. By the First Tee of Philadelphia. The First Tee helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit thefirsttphiladelphia.org. By the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. By Jersey Man Magazine, it's a Jersey way of life. And by Philly Man Magazine, bringing it to Broad Street. By the Haverford Trust Company, quality is in our DNA. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia Section PGA, experts in the game and business of golf. Take time to thank your local PGA golf professional. Golf is the great equalizer. For many, this journey is an escape from reality, a chance to be part of a team, a career opportunity. PGA Reach impacts lives through golf by lifting people up, giving them hope, and sending them down an alternate path that they never saw coming. With PGA Reach Philadelphia, as in life and in golf, the most important shot you take is the next one. Everyone is looking for something. Consistency. Quality. Peace of mind. Haverford Trust Company. Welcome back, Inside Golf. Today from Philadelphia Country Club, Gladwin, Pennsylvania. It wasn't always here. If you look at the logo for Philly Country Club, it says the club began in 1890. But that was in a different location. It's been here since the late 20s. And today we're talking about the East Falls Golf Association, which began at the original Philadelphia Country Club right along City Line Avenue on the Philadelphia side, not far from the Presidential, not far from Channel 6 and Channel 10. Yeah, that was a golf course back in the day. And it was home to the beginnings of the East Falls Golf Association, which is celebrating, by the way, its centennial this year, 100 years old. And we're here with two gentlemen who are, I guess you could say, imminent in uh, running the organization, the association today. Chris Kalmeyer, you like to call yourself a steward of the East Falls Golf Association. Absolutely. And Bill Dalton, who uh, is very involved with Chris in hosting what is going to be another big tournament for members of the East Falls Golf Association. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, gentlemen. Let's talk about the origins of what is known today, 100 years later, from the East Falls Golf Association. What was it all about? How did it get started? Absolutely, so the story starts in the early 1890s when golf was just starting here in the Philadelphia area. So in 1893, the Philadelphia Country Club built and finished the first golf course in this area. When that golf course opened, they needed caddies. It was located right across the river, a short walk across the bridge and up the hill. That's the Falls Bridge, the right? Falls it's still Bridge, there today, by Built the way. in 1900, still there today. So young boys, you know, 8, 10, 12, 14-year-old kids would walk across from, the, from East Falls, across the bridge, up the hill, and caddy at the Philadelphia Country Club, making perhaps 5, 10, or 15 cents wow. a bag. And that was a time when East Falls was very much a middle-class working uh, working class neighborhood with mills and so forth. So the parents of those kids were happy to get them out in the fresh air um, and working at the, at the club. And these, these sons of East Falls and other neighboring areas became those golf professionals. And leading up to 1920, they got together at a 
drinking establishment uh, in East Falls called the Gunboat, perhaps 100 yards from the Falls Bridge, and over drinks decided, let's start a golf tournament. And in 1920, the East Falls Open was born. It's still around, it's going to be played in September at at Sandy, Sandy Run, Run Country, Country Club. Club. But Sandy Run has been just one of many stops along the way. Of many, that's right. Your tournament. Uh, Chris mentioned the fact that a lot of the caddies went on to become professionals and kind of scattered around the country. We're going to be talking with our resident historian later in the show, that of course being Pete Trenum, and he's going to bring us up to date on some of the names, some of them pretty well known to uh, golf fans, not just in East Falls and Philadelphia area, but also around the country and around the world. That's how famous some of these guys became. Bill, let's talk about from the origin. How did this group continue for a hundred years? Thanks in large part to the efforts of people like yourselves, but over the years, I mean, guys who grew up or descendants of residents of East Falls kept this thing going. Yeah, so we're coming up on the 100th anniversary and um, been played uh, just about every year. I think a couple more years uh, we every took year. off. And um, the um, it, it comes down generation to generation. There was a generation above Chris and the guys that are involved today who handed it down about 30 years ago. And I was briefly involved at that time. Uh, but Chris and Joe Boyle and Joe DeFinis and Brian Murphy have really taken the tournament to the next stage for the last 15 years and brought some new venues with uh, North Hills and Sandy Run in recent years and uh, just continuing. And, and I'm sure Chris has got his eye out there for the next generation in, in a few years. The tournament that you have, one day event, and I think you said you're going to have almost, what, 130 golfers? 130 people this year. It's always been a one-day event, even back in the 1920s and 30s. Back then it was a one-day, 36-hole event, trying to identify the best uh, gross players, the best professional golfers and so forth in the area. In the 40s, it turned into a flighted event uh, by playing ability. Uh, we introduced an 18-hole playoff in 1980. And in the 90s, we introduced a six-hole same-day playoff which really makes it fun for the guys playing in every flight to earn a chance to play six extra holes in the afternoon to earn bragging rights for their flight. And it, the guys really look forward to it. Um, it gives them a chance to hit shots that matter, get a little bit nervous over a shot. Uh, they really enjoy it. And they come out year after year. We have some very loyal players now in our, in our hundredth year. Do they travel distances? Are they all from basically still the, the Philadelphia metropolitan area? Yeah, a gentleman is in my group uh, this year. He'll be, uh, he doesn't fly. He'll, he'll be driving from Chicago. Really? And uh, we played together last year. We're going to play together this year again. And uh, so, so people do uh, put it in the calendar and uh, put a red mark around it. And it's, it's the day that they're going to block out. Always the first day after Labor Day. Makes it easy for everyone to circle the calendar. Yeah, most of the players are East Falls residents or connected to East Falls, and we have five flights in the division, A, B, C, D, and E. So that gives everyone a chance to win, um, as Chris uh, mentioned. But we do have a guest flight, so outsiders are, are, are welcome to join us. And then we have a senior flight, so um, it gives so many people a chance to be a flight winner, um, ranging from someone who shoots uh, in the 70s, a scratch golfer, to someone shoots 100 or more. And... Uh, um, you know, it's mostly made up of these Falls guys, but, but we do have some, some groups from outside and we certainly enjoy having them. What's the range of age, for instance, this year from the youngest to the oldest competitors? 20, uh, early 20s into the 80s. Okay. And a lot of them uh, were caddies? That's not a necessarily a, a sine qua non to get into the event. That certainly is not a requirement. Um, I know I was a caddy, and I think several other uh, other guys as growing up were caddies in, in Philadelphia area clubs, which is a great tradition, and we're really proud that we're linked to that tradition of caddying. We're uh, joined here, as you have seen during the course of this interview so far, by the trophy. Is this the trophy that's still presented at least for a few minutes? to the winner of the September event? This is uh, the 1938 John B. Kelly, or Jack Kelly Trophy. Jack Kelly was an Olympic champion rower who Absolutely. was a, a national. Statue down along uh, Kelly Drive. Named, Kelly name Drive is named honor. after him. His, his daughter, daughter was Grace Kelly, the famous actress and, and Princess of Monaco. So this is named after, after Jack Kelly. This was created in 1938. We it ran out of space for names in about 1960 or so, or 1970. Um, so we do award this to the winner every year. They get to hold on to it for a year. Uh, we're actually thinking about commissioning a brand new trophy 
uh, this year to commemorate the 100. Sort of like almost a, a cloud jug thing. Huh? Have you seen some people imbibe from this, Bill? <laughs> um, you know, I think we had a guy a couple years ago who actually who wanted to take a sip. That's amazing. And you guys, both of you, stewards, along with some other names uh, who have been involved in keeping this tradition going. And it's probably the longest maybe in the country? That's our understanding. We, we, we say it's the longest running neighborhood amateur golf tournament um, in the country. A neighborhood golf, only in Philadelphia, which is a city of neighborhoods. City right? of neighborhoods. Yeah, right. And the Falls Bridge is still around and the East Falls Golf Association going strong at only 100 years old. Bill? Chris, good luck. Get your game ready for the big boys. You got it, Harry. <laughs> and you'll have a lot of fun, and maybe you'll get your name etched on that new trophy. You got to get that new trophy. That's right. Stay with us. Inside Golf will continue from Philadelphia Country Club. We'll be back with Pete Trenum. He's got some history with Philadelphia Country Club himself. That's next as we continue with Inside Golf. Where did grew up, Daddy? about your future, you have dreams. You want to succeed. That means achieving your goals, both big and small. At Citadel, we want to help you get there. We believe that success is achieved with the right plan, the right people, and the right determination. We're committed to your success, her success, and their success. Talk to us about how we can help you reach your goals. Citadel, banking with one focus, you. Welcome back, Inside Golf continues. We're at beautiful Philadelphia Country Club, Gladwin, Pennsylvania, on a perfect day. Just sitting by the 18th green, talking about golf. In particular, we're talking about the East Falls Golf Association. And here to take us down memory lane, as he does frequently on Inside Golf, Pete Trenum. Thank you. Mer Pro Emeritus at St. David's, one-time assistant here at Philadelphia Country Clubs. This is a little bit of a homecoming for you. 1962 right? to 1966. All right. And then you moved on to St. David's and the rest is, as they say, history. Right. But you're here to talk today about Philadelphia Country Club back when it began and where it began in the city limits, barely, but along City Line Avenue and the East Falls Golf Association, which turned out a number of very prominent golf professionals but they got started in the game as caddies at the old Philly Country Club. Give us a little rundown of some of the big names. Pete. That's right. Well, the, these boys from East Falls uh, walked across the East Falls Bridge, the Philadelphia Country Club, and started caddying. And, and uh, they wound up being golf professionals and uh, caddy masters and whatever. But there were, by one count, there was a total of 48. 48 of 48 them became professionals. Became professionals. Now, the, the, and they all lived right there in East right. Falls. Now, one thing was a little different in those days. If you caddied after the age of 16, you were a golf professional in the eyes of the USGA. Really? How about that? But anyway, these boys, the most famous was Jack Burke, who was the father of Jackie Burke. And uh, Jack Who's Burke. Who's a Masters winner, Jack Burke Jr. Masters and a PGA. Right. And uh, Jack Burke Sr. caddied there as a young boy. And uh, Jack Burke. Uh, now, when you hear Jack Burke Jr., you think of Houston, Texas. So tell us how the Burke name got from East Falls well, to Jack, Texas. Jack Sr. started out there, and then he was the pro at four different places, or maybe even more in Philadelphia, like uh, Aronimic and uh, Lannard and, uh, and Old York Road and Hershey. Jack Burke Sr. Uh, was a very good player and uh, he worked all over the Midwest. He worked in Minnesota, he worked in Canada, and uh, he won the Minnesota Open four times in five years. And uh, while he was in Minnesota, he finished second in the 1920 U.S. Open at, at Toledo when Ted Ray won it and Terry Varden wow. fell apart and a couple other guys fell apart. And, so, and eventually he made his way down to Houston to get warm. He was second. <laughs> well, he, he started going down there in the wintertime. Okay. 
and uh, he, he finished second in the 1913 Canadian Open. I mean, he could really play. He also played here uh, when he was almost 50 years later on, old. Later right? on, he, he played in 16 U.S. Opens. And in 1939, the U.S. Open was here, and he qualified again at the age of 49 and played it? here and missed the cut by one stroke. Byron Nelson won it when Sam Snead took an eight when he only needed a six to win the whole thing. He said somebody gave him some bad information, but that's for, that's for another story. Yeah, that's another day, yeah. But anyway, I, Joe Roseman's an interesting story. Joe Roseman, I was a couple of years older than Jack Burke, and he got to Iowa in 1903 at, at, the, age of, at the age of 21, and uh, at the Des Moines Country Club, he was a pro and green superintendent, but he was a, he was a born tinkerer and inventor, whatever, but he, uh, he went from, uh, Iowa to Racine, Wisconsin, where he started building golf courses. And he built 50 golf courses and he altered 100 more. And then he went to Chicago, where he was a pro at uh, Westmoreland Country Club in Chicago. And uh, he was first president of the uh, Illinois PGA in 1921. Now you're wearing, speaking of 1921, you're wearing a hat, which is the logo for the Philadelphia section PGA of America's 100th anniversary, right. which will be coming up in 2021, 1921 is when it began. And a lot of those East Falls guys right. were very prominent at the start. When the PGA started in 1916, there were only seven PGA sections covering the whole United States. But they decided after a few years that that was ungainly, so they broke it up and they, they went to 21 section. So the Philadelphia section got created in 1921 and the Illinois section got created then and Joe Roseman was the first president of the Illinois section. How about it? Let's jump to this club I'm holding here. Right. It's uh, one of yours. It's had a, it has a few shots in it, but it still has a grip, and in the 30 seconds or so, what's the history of this grip? Well, Jack Burke Sr., one day he had a flat tire, which happened a lot years ago, <laughs> and uh, he was sitting by the road, and he's looking at his tire, and he saw these threads in the tire, these cords, and he thought, why couldn't you have a golf grip with a, those cords in there? So he invented a grip. And when I was a young boy caddying, everybody called it the, the Burt grip. But all weather, what we call later the I'm all sure weather grip. I'm sure he got a patent for it, he right? He got a patent on it. Made a lot of money, I'm sure, and, too. And uh, he, uh, he started a company called the Burt Par Golf Company and so, sold these grips and other things. All right, yeah. Pete, as always. Thanks for the history lesson. You're welcome. All right, stay with us. We're still going. We'll have our teed off panel here on Inside Golf. There's no limit to what this guy can do. Welcome back. Inside Golf continues today from beautiful Bluestone Country Club in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. We're here on the back patio to tee it off with our teed off panel of Joe Logan from MyPhillyGolf.com. Leo Mackey. She's with the Philadelphia section, PGA of America. She's the foundation director and our host today here at Bluestone, head pro, Chris Gardner. Thanks for coming out. Good to see you. Thanks for having us. Uh, Phil Mickelson, right before the recently played Open Championship, announced via social media and uh, other interviews, whatever, that he had gone on a, I think a 15 day fast he had lost, uh, or a 10-day fast, he lost 15 pounds, and it was going to be part of the new fill. He didn't make the cut. Now, I don't know if that's going to influence whether he continues such a practice or not, but he's also getting these fireside chats out there on Twitter. He, um, he's becoming like a different Phil. What's going on? Uh, Phil's got a lot of Not personality. Not you would know, no, but... <laughs> I don't know him personally, but yeah, and Phil's got a lot of personality, and I think he is showcasing it much more than he used to. I mean, we, we've seen a little more personality out of Tiger in recent years yeah. since his comeback, but, but Phil especially is, is showing uh, humor, if you will. Uh, he's, he's out there. He's, he's hitting bombs, basically, is all he keeps talking about on Twitter and, and all the social media, but he is going to be... Uh, almost like Arnold Palmer, where he, he's almost as big outside the game of golf as he is inside the game of golf. And I don't think his best, uh, he's not going to have his best days in front of him. His best days are behind him, but he's still going to be competitive. He won this year on tour. He's still going to have his name on the first page of a, of a leaderboard and, and a major in the near future. But uh, he wants to be a brand, I think. And he's doing a good job right now doing it. 
Uh, the fasting, I can't comment much on that. It didn't work for him that week, but if he's looking good, feeling good, hitting it the way he wants, then good for him. Right. I think he's preparing for a, a new phase in, in his life. I'm not even talking about necessarily a competitive phase, Leela. Um, I would say, yes, I would say he's probably somebody who wants to keep his options open. He seems like he um, wants to continue to be in the golfing community, at whatever that capacity may be. So that's kind of how he wants to keep up with the times and, you know, at least have the opportunity to commentate or whatever he wants to do. Um, but yeah, I would say he would want to uh, certainly stay in the face of the golfing public. Yeah, you know, Nick Faldo certainly has made a niche down a pretty nice broadcast career. And uh, when he was a player, uh, he, he was not the friendliest, warmest, cuddly type of guy. I mean, the press, especially in the UK, they disliked him tremendously. He had to rebuild his image. And, and Mickelson, I don't think, has that far to go as Faldo did. But if Faldo can do it, anybody can do it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Maybe he'll join us here on the Inside Golf one day. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. There's an open invitation. Joe, uh, do you agree with uh, the comments agree. so far? Uh, he is smart. I've sat through a million interviews with him. He's smart. He's articulate. Uh, and when he finally stops playing the game, uh, I agree with Chris. I was The example I was thinking of was Greg Norman, but Palmer may be an even better uh, I I example because this, there's no limit to what this guy can do. Uh, he may spend a minute in the booth. He may do that on the side. I don't see being a color guy on one of the networks. Well, it all depends on what kind of dollars they're going to throw at him, I right? think he's going to be a mogul in the, in the in the way that Palmer is and probably own TV shows and it's just going to be a, a, a smart So he's going to take it beyond what we've seen from the likes of a, a Nick Faldo or yes. somebody like that. Yes. Well, you know, again, is, is he the type of guy that's going to end up having his own event someday? Uh, you know, I Nicholas has got his, Palmer's got his, Tiger's got his now in L.A. I mean, does, does Phil, is he going to pursue maybe having his signature event on tour? What about, does that lead then, does, it, does Tiger's advisor say, okay, Tiger, we got we got to do a similar warm-up all of a sudden. I mean, he is getting warmer. But do you ever see him getting quite as warm as what Phil's doing now? I think he's gotten better, but I don't think he's done what Phil's doing. Yeah, I mean, I it's think it's all personality it driven it's, to begin with, right? It's Phil's natural personality. Tiger is actually shyer than you would think from, you know, what he is and what he's done. And he always had the kind of the wall up. Yes. The handlers took Absolutely. care of handling everything for him. From the time he was a little kid. Right. Uh, Phil's much more outgoing. I mean, he's just a better interview. And I, I mean, in the, in the media side. I'm very curious, too. We've talked about outside the game, but inside the game, you know, we've seen a lot of great players make it on the Champions Tour, and, and that's a very competitive uh, atmosphere. But have we seen anybody like Phil quite hit the you know, Champions don't Tour yet? I mean, it, I don't even know how much he'll play if he wants to play, but boy, what a draw that would be um, if he ever does want to step away from the PGA Tour and play more Champions Golf. But. A lot will depend on his health. I remember Seve, when he turned 50, tried to the uh, Champions Tour, and after a while, his game wasn't there, and then, of course, unfortunately, he got ill. Longer, however, is a major winner multiple times, yeah. and uh, still out there and still competing. But you know what? Longer has, is a much more sort of a tournament golfer, not that Phil's not, but Longer does not have the sort of Gregarious, you know, gregarious personality that Phil Mickelson has. That will translate into business and money in ways that Longer is a great golfer and a great guy, but he doesn't light up a room the way Phil Mickelson does. The last last personality to hit that tour was really John Daly. Uh, was one that really kind of turned some some heads, and he doesn't quite have what Phil has at all. But um, and he's driving off literally into the sunset, right? Unfortunately, panel, thank you. And we'll be back. More of Inside Golf coming up. Located in Bluebell, just a short drive from Plymouth Meeting, Bluestone Country Club offers a setting that's close at hand but feels like a world away. Bluestone offers a championship caliber golf course, practice facilities including a large driving range, separate chipping and putting areas, and a staff of PGA professionals. At the Country House at Bluestone, you'll find excellent food, superb service, and an outstanding setting. Their expert staff will assist in planning your next event, whether it's a wedding or simply a lunch and dinner or cocktail party. Check out Bluestone's variety of membership options. Much more than a golf course, Bluestone is a community. 
students in our program learn a lot about leadership and how to become we a have leader. good cause, we've got great kids and people. It, it teaches young people not only golf, but the life lessons that golf teaches us. I've been a better person throughout my um, career in golf. We're teaching kids how to be better kids, how to be better people and to build better communities. Respect, honesty, courtesy, integrity, judgment. Not only does it give kids a jump start on the game of golf, but maybe a little bit of a jump start on the game of life. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of Inside Golf. Another centennial celebration. This one for the East Falls Golf Association. Uh, they will get together September 9th at Sandy Run for their centennial tournament. Boy, what an interesting trip down memory lane we had today, talking about an association that began in East Falls with East Falls natives and young guys that used to just caddy at then Philadelphia Country Club, right along City Line Avenue, and it's still going with their descendants and others who can trace their roots and their golf to the East Falls neighborhood of Philadelphia. And Perhaps you never knew about this golf association and maybe have some lineage to East Falls. Well, follow this graphic, get in touch with them, find out. Maybe you become a member of the East Falls Golf Association. I'm Harry Donahue. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, no matter how bad it's going for you out there, don't pick up. We will see you next time right here on Inside Golf. Inside Golf is presented by Destination Monco Golf, 54 courses, 300,000 yards. Check them out at MoncoGolf.com. Buy the first tee of Philadelphia. The first tee helps young men and women become better golfers, but most important, better people. Get involved. Visit TheFirstTeePhiladelphia.org. Buy the Golf Association of Philadelphia, GAP, celebrating amateur golf since 1897. Buy Jersey Man Magazine. It's a Jersey way of life. And by Philly Man Magazine, bringing it to Broad Street. By the Haverford Trust Company. Quality is in our DNA. And by Inside Golf's partner since 1998, the Philadelphia Section PGA. Experts in the game and business of golf. Take time to thank your local PGA golf professionals.